Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together and receive from your word. Father, we know the Holy Spirit is the teacher. And so, Father, we yield to him tonight, to his ministry as the teacher of the church. We believe that he will anoint and move as he sees fit here this evening. We thank you, Father, for the clarity of your word. We thank you that it instructs us in everything that we should do, how we should live, how we should speak. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's look at Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. And uh, we're going to look beginning in verse 3, where the word says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Now, before we go any further, let's go back and look at the meaning of that word peace. You know, the, the Hebrew word peace most of you have heard before is the word shalom. The interesting thing about this particular instance, this particular case in the word, is he uses the word shalom, shalom. In other words, he says it twice. Thou will keep him in shalom, shalom. Now, keep in mind that shalom is not just peace. You know, everything is nice and there's nothing abrasive and, you know, disturbing and all that. That's not just the meaning of this word peace. This word peace also means nothing broken, nothing damaged, everything sound, okay? And he says here, just as we said, that will keep him in shalom, shalom, perfect peace. Now, the way the King James you know, translators decide to, to get that across is to say perfect peace, shalom, shalom. In other words, it's reinforced. <laughs> it's heavy-duty peace, <laughs> heavy-duty soundness. Amen? I like that. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Now, notice it didn't say whose spirit or heart. Now, that's obvious. Our spirit or our heart is born again. We're connected directly to God because of that. But he's centering up here on the mind. The mind, the will, the emotions. So the mind is what needs to be stayed on him because he trusteth in thee, verse 4, trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Now, the reason I bring this scripture up, this is only peripherally. This is like I said, I could go one or two ways here. <laughs> but this is peripherally what we're going to talk about tonight. And that's this. These days that we live in, I'm sure you know, are not days in the natural, in the world, of peace. That pretty much goes without saying. You know, everything we see on TV, everything that we see represented, particularly in the Middle East, is not peace. It's not soundness. It's not completeness, that part of the definition, and it's not peace in the classic meaning of the definition. And so if we aren't, if we're not diligent, trying to look for the best word there, if we're not diligent, we can be pulled into a mental state that is not at peace, that is nervous, that goes so far as to say frightened, of what's going on in the world. I, I was listening today to some of my colleagues at work, and of course some are believers and some aren't. And most of the believers aren't believing believers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, they're born again, that's about it. All right, okay, they're not really hanging in there with the Word of God. So all of them are talking about, man, did you see what they're doing? And ISIS and this and that, and this guy got beheaded, and the other guy got beheaded, and well, what are we going to do, and all this kind of stuff. And it, there was just a a lack of peace, a disturbedness. I know that's not a word, but we'll make it up as we go along. So I forgot to thinking about that, and I began to think about this scripture. Trust in the Lord, and those who will keep him in perfect peace are those whose mind is stayed on the Lord. It's easy to get your mind stayed on the circumstance and thinking about what all is going on 
and not think about where you are in relation to the Lord. You know, we've really, and, and this sounds rather arrogant in one sense, but as believers, we kind of got it made. I mean, even if they, and, and I'm not confessing this, okay, this is not a statement of faith or whatever, but if ISIS was to come to the U.S., grab us out of our houses, drag us in the street and behead us, we'd be in heaven. You know? <laughs> I mean, we get the last laugh on that. They think they're doing so much damage and all they're doing is just getting us to heaven quicker. So, even if the worst that people are talking about, like at work, comes to pass, we're still fine. Now, at the same time, I believe for supernatural protection. I believe for angelic protection. I don't believe they'll be able to come in and drag us out in the street. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just saying, worst case scenario, we're still blessed. So don't let the news drag you down. Don't get away from this perfect peace, this shalom, shalom. The only way to do it is to keep your mind on the Lord. And this is the thing that I think we're missing so much, is we're not keeping our mind straight on the things of God, on the Lord. We have lights. <laughs> it just came to pass. Hallelujah. All right. I looked up and I went, whoa, light. Uh, <laughs> so let's look at another couple of directions of Scripture that I want to go. And... Uh, talk about something that I think will help us keep our heart stayed on Him. Keep our heart focused on the things of God and therefore keep us in perfect peace and therefore keep us in complete soundness in every area. And realize that soundness is not just uh, soundness like you're not going to fall apart, you know. It can be financial soundness. It can be physical health soundness. Any area where you have a need is met keeping your mind stayed on the Lord. So let's look at a, another couple of scriptures. Let's look at Proverbs 7, 1. Proverbs 7, 1. My son, keep my words, or we could put it this way, keep the word of God, and lay up my commandments with thee. Now I know in these days there's a lot of people who don't want to hear the word commandments. But commandments... There's nothing wrong with that. You've heard me say this before when we were teaching along different lines over in the book of, I believe it's 1 John, where it talks about the commandments of God are not grievous. And what does that mean? It means the commandments of God are not hard to do. They're not difficult. They're not uh, unreasonable. So commandments just mean, as a matter of fact, if you study out the word in the Greek, in that other reference that we just talked about, you study it out in the Greek, it means authoritative prescriptions. So all a commandment is, is God giving you an authoritative prescription. Now if a doctor gives you an authoritative prescription, it's to heal or fix some malady in your body. And so if God gives you an authoritative prescription, there's a reason for it. He's just not being hard to get along with. He gives you a commandment to protect you. I posted on Facebook, oh it's been probably a couple months ago now, an interesting little cartoon that I saw. And uh, it was a, showed a guy who was standing beside of a, a little guardrail at the edge of a cliff. And uh, says, I don't like to be hemmed in by these guardrails. And he jumped over it. Well, below him was a drop of a thousand feet cliff, you know. And the guy said, no, the guardrails aren't there to restrain you. They're there to protect you, <laughs> keep you from jumping off the cliff. Well. That's really what a, a commandment is all about. It is an authoritative prescription that is there for our benefit. Nothing wrong with a commandment. So he says in verse 2, keep my commandments and live. What does that say about those that don't keep the commandments? Uh-oh. <laughs> they end up dying. And you know, when you don't keep the commandments, that typically means sin, and the way of sin ends up in death. That makes sense. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. I like that. We shouldn't be getting away from law when it's authoritative prescription. We should be making it the apple of our eye. We love to not sin. That should be our attitude. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians out there, it seems like, that 
They want to sin so bad that they get really nervous when you start talking about commandments. Well, that's just flesh. They're just leaning to their flesh. Verse 3. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them... Now, I've got this in my notes here. I've got it bolded. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Well, that's good, but how do you write them on the table of your heart? Have you ever thought about that? Okay, Lord, I'm going to write your law, your word, on the table of my heart. Well, how do I do it? Well, there's a scripture that tells us how to do it. Psalm 45, verse 1 says, My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. Here it is. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. How do I write the word of God on my heart? My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. How do I write the word on my heart? My tongue. Speaking words. So if I'll take the word of God and put it in my mouth and speak it out of my mouth, I am writing that word on my heart. Now, think about this. Isn't that what we're talking about when we talk about the difference? And you know, I trust you know this, there is a difference between a confession of faith to build it into your heart and a confession of faith which leads to manifestation. Okay? That's a subtle difference to a lot of people, and a lot of people don't understand it. But once you understand that, you will understand that the only way you're going to build a vision of you healed into your heart is to confess the Word of God concerning healing. Amen. Now when you start saying, by His stripes we were healed, therefore I am the healed of the Lord, you may be thinking, yeah, but I feel sick. See, your feeling circumstance, your feeling symptoms, your feeling what your body's telling you. Your mind may be thinking on what your body's telling you. You may be in pain, so you feel pain, therefore you know you're sick. Yet the Word of God says, by His stripes we were. Well, if we were healed, then I am the healed. Therefore, I may be, you know, Satan may be trying to make me sick, but I am the healed. The truth of the Word of God is I'm the healed. So I've got to look at the higher truth. Well, how do I put that higher truth in my heart? I speak it. So I speak healing. I confess the word of God concerning healing. I go to Psalm 103, 1 through 3, and I talk about, Bless the Lord of my soul, who healeth all my diseases. Well, as I confess that, it builds it into my heart. Now, so far, I haven't spoken out the word in a way that will cause manifestation. I'm still meditating on it. The Hebrew word meditate literally means to mutter. M-U-T-T-E-R, mutter. And I know all of you have muttered before. I have certainly muttered before. Working with a computer, you have opportunities to mutter. <laughs> ah, this thing, why don't ever... Well, that's what muttering is. You're speaking words out of your mouth. Unfortunately, most people have experience with it in the negative. Ah, that stupid hunk of junk. Well, that's not going to bless you. It's not going to bless the hunk of junk, <laughs> you know. It's going to cause more problems and issues. So you don't want to be building that into your heart by speaking. You want to be confessing blessing over your stuff. I confess blessing over my computers. My computers work very well. They don't ever crash. They don't ever have virus infections. They just run and run and run and run. Now part of that, to be honest, is because I know how to take care of computers, but the other part is I'm confessing blessing over my equipment. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You can do that. I mean, if the children of Israel's shoes didn't wear out as they left Egypt, then my computer won't wear out. Amen? Amen? You know, now if I choose to get another one, that's my business. But as <laughs> long as I've got the one of God, I'm gonna, it's going to be blessed and it's going to keep running. It's not going to have issues. So... Uh, and, and I have seen, I mean, Blenda can tell you, when you look back at all the computers we had, I can't remember but maybe one or two hard drive crashes and just f few and far between. And we've had computers for years and years and years. So it, it, it works to confess over your stuff. But the point is muttering, speaking, confessing. You confess your healing to build it into your heart. Your tongue 
is as the pen, notice, is as compared to the pen of a ready writer. So I'm going to write the Word of God on my heart concerning healing, concerning finances, concerning all kinds of blessing. And particularly, this is one that I've been intentionally trying to center up on, and that is favor, the favor of God. Favor will just bless you in so many ways. It'll bless you at work. It'll bless you with your family. You'll have favor with your kinfolk. And we all know we need favor with our kinfolk. <laughs> and we need favor at work. And when there are times, you know, when other people at work are going, ah, you know, this is going that way, and that's, it's all going to come down around our ears and all this kind of stuff. No. I'm believing for favor. I'm believing for blessing. And so I confess that. And I'm writing it on the, my heart. I'm writing it down in there on those tables in my heart. Now, the tongue is as a pen of a ready writer, so I'm going to start using the word. Now let's look at some other things about the word here. Very familiar scripture, Mark 11, 22. We could just stop right there and you go, oh yeah, I know what that says. Well, let's read it anyway. Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Some translations say have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, that's me, I'm a whosoever, shall say unto this mountain, first say, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith, there's our second say, shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Three saiths to one believeth. <laughs> As Brother Hagin liked to point out. We got three saiths and one believeth. Well, that's good. The reason we need so much saying is because we're writing it on the tables of our heart. We're getting it down in there. We're saying it and saying it and saying it. Now the number of times you say it does not determine how fast you're going to get it. Talking about manifestation. What you're doing is you're building it in there. You're writing it in there. You're filling up those tables. You know, imagine your heart as though it were a big pad of paper and you're just writing over and over. You know, it's like the guy in class. He's got to write over and over. I will not do this. I will not do this. I will. Well, what we're doing is we're writing, I am blessed. I am blessed. I am favored. I am healed. Over and over on the, our heart. Writing it down in there. Now, what's going to happen when we write it down in there? If we write it down in there enough, we're going to have something called abundance in our heart. Well, what happens with stuff that's in your heart in abundance? It comes out your mouth. Out of the abundance of your heart, what you've written in there, your mouth speaketh. The difference is, whatever is in abundance in your heart that you speak is what comes to pass. So when you first start out this process and you start, you start confessing the word concerning healing, confessing the word concerning finances, whatever it is, favor, there's a part of you going, you know, I don't know about this. Now we don't lean to that. We don't let that pull us off. We keep our minds stayed on Him, keep ourselves in perfect peace, but at the same time, we're, we know we're weak in faith. You know what I'm saying? And that's not a good place to be. But you're doing the right thing by continuing to confess the Word, confess the Word, building it in your heart, writing it in your heart, getting it in there in abundance. And once it's in abundance, amazing thing happens. All of a sudden, the doubts go away. All of a sudden, you're confessing from a point of strength, not weakness. You say, by his stripes we were healed, therefore I'm the healed of the Lord. And it just, whew, it comes out of you. And you can feel the difference. Now, understand, I know we're not driven or live by our feelings. But ooh, it feels good. When you know that you know that you know that you're the healed of the Lord. When you confess it out of your mouth that it comes out with power. And you go, yeah! and you feel like you could just take on a whole army. That means it's coming out of your heart in abundance, and that's when it comes to pass. Now let's keep reading. Amen. He says, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Notice it doesn't say, believe that you've got it, and you got it. No, it says, believe that you receive now, 
and you shall have. Now, the first time I saw this and really understood it, I went, oh, okay. Me saying it now doesn't mean it necessarily comes to pass now. No, the point at which it comes to pass in the natural manifestation in your life is when you have built it in your heart in abundance, it comes out of your mouth, and it comes to pass. That may very well be a shall have down the road. But that's no reason to quit writing it on your heart. That's no reason to quit confessing it. That's no reason to say, you know, to change your confession and say, well, I must not be the healed. No, that's contrary. See, now you're in there with your eraser erasing it off that tablet. That means it's not going to be in there in abundance. You want it in there in abundance, so you want to keep writing it in there. Like the guy up on the blackboard, I will not do this. Well, you're writing, I am the healed of the Lord, over and over and over, and it keeps coming out of your mouth and coming out of your mouth, and finally it's in there in abundance, and then it comes out with power, and it comes to pass. Now, Matthew 12, 34. He's talking to scribes and Pharisees here, but there's a very powerful truth in this, in this verse. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. That's what we were just referring to. Whatever's in there in abundance is what you're going to say. Now what are you saying about the scribes and Pharisees is you guys don't have any word in you. You're evil and so the words that come out of your mouth are evil. And let's, not, let's see if that's not what he's saying. Ma uh, Matthew 12, 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart. Now the word treasure there means depository. Like you take your money and deposit it in the bank. It's that kind of a thing. You're depositing. A good man out of the good deposit of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil deposit of his heart brings forth evil things. So what does this say? It says what you put in your heart is what's going to come out. The evil man puts in evil stuff. He's busy cussing and watching junk on TV that he shouldn't be watching and all this kind of mess. And he's building that down into his heart. And it's no wonder that it comes flying out of his mouth when he gets, you know, the buttons get pushed. Well, what about a good man? A good man out of the good treasury of his heart brings forth good things. Well, if I deposit the word, I mean, there's nothing better than the word. It's a good thing. <laughs> so I put the word in my heart. I build it in there in abundance, it's going to come out of my mouth. Verse 36, but I say to you that every idle, inoperative, non-productive word, that's what the Greek says there, every non-productive word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, a lot of people look at that and say, every cuss word I've ever said, God's going to list it out for me when I get to the day of judgment. Okay, but that's not really what he's talking about. There's a day of judgment concerning every situation of life that you're in. Not just the great day of judgment that's coming. There's a day when the balances are going to get weighed depending on what, how you have thought, how you have acted, how you have spoken. There's a day of judgment. You know, it's like Pastor talks about the scripture that says the evil day is coming. And the evil day will come. Well, evil days tend to be the results of what we have confessed previously. <laughs> You know, well, I'm going to get the flu because I always get the flu this time of year. Well, guess what? You are setting yourself up for an evil day. You're writing that junk in your heart. How do we get away from an evil day? We have good days by confessing the word, building it into our heart, writing it into those tablets of our heart in abundance, and then it comes flying out of our mouth and we have a good day. The day of judgment comes in either case, but the day of judgment is, whoo, you put good stuff in you're going to get blessed. You put bad stuff in, you're going to get cursed. Still a day of judgment. See, there's nothing negative about judgment if it's righteous judgment. If you are judged based on your efforts, you know, I was telling Belinda driving down the road this evening, uh, a friend of mine at work shared something. You've probably seen it on Facebook. That's where he said he saw it. He's talking about a teacher. And this teacher was doing a class, I think, on socialism, I think was the issue. And uh, did this class and had her first test. 
And the people who studied and worked hard, oh my goodness, they got A's. Well, then there were a bunch of other people that didn't study and work hard, and they got, you know, C's and D's. And they were all getting all mouthy and saying, oh, it's not fair, these people made A's and we got all these bad grades. Well, the teacher said, well, okay, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to run this class like socialism. We're going to curve the grade. And so what happened is the people that worked really hard, they got A's, but then the people didn't work hard at all, they started getting C's, better grades. And they were like, yeah, this is great. Well, then the people who were working hard thought, well, why should I work hard? I'm going to get a good grade anyway. So they got, they didn't work as much, and so their grades came down. Well, when their grades came down, everybody else's grades came down. So now the people who got C's are getting D's again. And the people who got A's are getting B's and C's. And it just kept declining. And she said, what have we learned out of this? Well, the, the, the lesson to be learned is this kind of socialistic society will lead to people not excelling because they don't have to work harder. They're not rewarded for their work. And so the incentive is not there for them to get a good grade. And without the incentive, their grades drop off. Well, pull that over into spiritual things. If you don't study the Word, meditate the Word, confess the Word, you're not going to be studying to show yourself approved, and you're not going to be blessed. And there's a whole bunch of people that have heard the word of faith and they've heard the power of confession and, and they're in a state now because this is the spirit that's at work in the church, unfortunately, right now. They're in a state now, well, you know, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to do anything. Well, their grade's getting bad. They're flunking. That's right. And the thing is, the day of judgment is coming on that situation. And in their individual lives, they're going to find that they're not going to be blessed like they used to be when they were confessing the Word and living the Word and speaking the Word and strong on the Word, fellowshipping together and tithing. And then they look around and go, what happened? My grades fell. It's how much work you put into it. Work. You know, I always think of men or G. Krebs. Work. <laughs> Four-letter word. But you know, there, there's good work. There's work that when you do it, you feel, you know, wow, I did something good, you know. There's pride that you take in your work. There's nothing wrong with work. You, we don't have works to get born again, but after you're born again, you should have good works. That's what the Scripture says. So anyway, every idle, non-productive word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in that day of judgment, the day that is coming when those words will be judged, whether at the, the judgment or in more immediately, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So if you're looking for why you are succeeding or failing in life, it's words. Words are all important. And we've kind of, the body of Christ, let's put it this way, the body of Christ has kind of gotten away from the importance of words. We've, we've kind of gotten away from understanding that our words are important. The pastor likes to kid with me about, that I come out of the you know, early days of charismatic word of faith message where we were all confession beepers. And boy, we jump on each other like a chicken on a bug. That's what, that's your confession. I believe every word of it's going to come to pass. You know, and oh my goodness. And we jump on each other like that. Well, you know, maybe that's coming from the wrong spirit, but the intensity that we had for watching what we say the amount that we cared in the good sense of the word for what we said and how we spoke was beneficial to us. So, you know, I, maybe we ought to fire up our confession beepers again. And, but maybe do it nicer than we used to do it, you know? Right. Brother, is that really what you want to be saying? I don't know. But anyway... Let's look at Luke. I was trying to decide whether to go this route or not, but we will. Luke 11, 2. He saith unto him, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. So what should we be confessing? Whatever we believe we will have in heaven, we should be believing to have it here on earth. Are we going to be healed in heaven? Yes. So I'm the healed. 
Are our needs going to be met in heaven? Absolutely. So I, my needs are met. We confess in earth what we believe we shall have in heaven. And a lot of us, a lot of Christians are really, oh, absolutely, I know I'm going to have streets of gold in heaven. I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to have a mansion. Oh, Jesus is preparing it for me. It's going to be great. Well, then confess here on earth as in heaven. Do we have any sickness and disease in heaven? No. Then we need to be confessing we're the healed of the Lord here on earth as in heaven. All right. Death and life, this is Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, I was teaching the word right here, Faith and Victory Church. Don't remember the date. I'd pull up Brother Hagin and say, yeah, it was December the 20th, 1981. I don't know what it was. You know what I'm saying? But sometime or another, I was teaching here, and I read this scripture, and all of a sudden, it jumped out at me. I never really fully understood the scripture. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And the Lord simply said to me, it what? <laughs> and I went, what? So I had to go back and read it again. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it, it death, no, it life, well, maybe. But what's he really talking about? The power of the tongue. They that love the power of the tongue shall eat the fruit thereof. And all of a sudden, it was like a light just exploded in my thinking. I went, wait a minute. Because, see, I don't know about you, but there have been times that I thought, Lord, why did it have to be my words? Couldn't it have been everything I write down? Couldn't it have been maybe what I dream? You know, anything but my words. And I saw that, you know what? I'm not loving the process. I'm not loving the system. I need to actually love the system. And I saw it in a whole different light. I began to realize, wait a minute, God gave us this method to bless us, not to hurt us. He gave us the method of speaking words and having them come to pass as a blessing. I need to love the system. I need to actually be excited about the fact that what I say is going to come to pass. Well, that means it should give me incentive to say good things if what I say is going to come to pass. So, going back and reading again, death and life are in the power of tongues. See, we tend to focus there. That's true. Death is in the power of the tongue. That's true. Life is in the power of the tongue. But they that love that system will eat the fruit thereof. I'm going to partake of the fruit of that system if I get excited about it and realize, whoo, this is a good thing that I get to have whatever I say. Now it's not a burden anymore. It's a blessing. Just by changing that little attitude adjustment a bit. Teach me, this is what Job said, Job 6.24, Teach me and I will hold my tongue and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. How forcible are right words. But what doth, what doth your arguing reprove? Teach me and I will hold my tongue. In other words, okay, this is what, the Lord, what Job's telling the Lord. Lord, okay, look, I've missed it. I have said some things I shouldn't have said. I have gotten in doubt and unbelief and fear, particularly with regard to my kids. So what I need to do is just stop. I will hold my tongue. I'm not going to say anything until you teach me wherein I have erred. What do I need to change? What, is, what should my confession really be? And here's the revelation he got. How powerful are right words? Well, where do we get our right words? The Word of God. That's where the right words come from. So if we'll confess the Word, then they are forcible. They are powerful. Now, I'm going to quickly read a couple of other scriptures here, and we'll, uh, we'll move on here. James 3, 6, The tongue is a fire and sets on fire the course of nature. If you study that out, and we won't take the time to go into it in great detail because it is tempting to do, but it would take us a whole other session. But what he's saying here is, your tongue will set in motion the cycle of natural events in your life. That's what the course of nature in the Greek means. The cycle of natural events. So the, the cycle of natural events in your life, your path in life, is directed by your tongue. 
Proverbs 12, 18. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise... Why are you wise? Because you're speaking the Word of God. You're speaking what the Word has to say about your health. The tongue of the wise is health. Proverbs 15, 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the Spirit. A wholesome tongue, a tongue that's speaking health and healing and right words and the Word of God is a tree of life. Hallelujah. Uh, Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Keep your mouth, keep your tongue on the Word of God. And then Romans 4, 17, as it is written, I made thee a father of many nations before, him he, before whom he believed, even God who quickens or makes alive the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Good old King James. But basically what he's saying is, call the things that don't exist yet like they did. Amen. You don't feel like you're the heel of the Lord? Well, confess you're the heel of the Lord because you are. Amen. According to 1 Peter 2, 24, you are the healed of the Lord were past tense. So you can confess that you're the heel. Now, you don't, you're not necessarily, obviously, confessing, I'm not sick, because that's not what the Word of God is saying. The Word is saying that you're the healed. And if I'm the healed, Satan may be trying to make me sick, but I am the healed, and so healing is mine. That's a good confession, not I am not sick. Okay? Because then you're just denying what is. And that's what Christian science teaches. We don't deny what is. We confess the higher law. We confess what the Word of God has to say about us. All righty, well, praise the Lord. What I mainly wanted to focus in on tonight is the power of words, stirring back up in us a knowledge that the key to all of these things is your words. And keeping our mind and our heart stayed on the Word of God, stayed on the Lord, and particularly in these days with so much going on, keep yourself focused. Keep yourself focused on the Word of God. That's where it's at. That's where we will be in a position that the world cannot be in because they're not doing what we're doing. They could. They could get born again. They could receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They could study the Word of God. They could confess the Word of God. Same thing we've done, that God's not holding out on anybody. But you have to do it. Praise the Lord. All righty, hallelujah. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Praise the Lord. Just some good old faith teaching. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's what I like. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.